Well, thank you, Walker and choir and orchestra. Man, if I look that good in a bow tie, I'd wear one every Sunday. What a great looking young man. And what an incredible worship time this morning. We are loved, aren't we? God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's true love, isn't it? He loved us when we were unlovely. And the truth is, he continues to do that. And the scripture says we love him because he first loved us. And so today I want to share with you a message entitled, Why I Love Jesus Christ. With your New Testament open there, if you have your Bible or follow along on screen, to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to just kind of launch the message by going down to the end of that passage, verse 8, which simply says, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now that's the text. (laughs) The context is verses 1 through verse 8. Because at the end of that text, Peter is telling us why, and those previous seven verses, he's telling us why in verse 8 he loves Jesus Christ. And I just want to tell you, I love him for those same reasons. And I, I hope that you do too. And I hope today those of you who have not yet come to love the Lord Jesus Christ might recognize how worthy He is of your love. Jesus asked Simon Peter two major questions in His brief three-year ministry and association with Simon Peter. The first question related to the person of Christ. And Jesus, speaking to the disciples, said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That was a general question addressed to all of the disciples, but in usual Petrine fashion, Peter speaks first. And he is the voice of the twelve. And Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter gave a great answer. Jesus told him, Peter, you didn't learn that in a classroom somewhere. God taught you that. And that's the first and imperative question we must answer is, who is Jesus? But once we come to the conclusion that, as Peter did, that he's the Son of God, then the second question Jesus asked Peter in John 21 was this. Peter, do you love me? (laughs) Profoundly simple question. Peter, do you love me? But he asked it a third time. Peter, do you love me? I believe that Jesus would come to each one of us seated here this morning and press to our heart that very same question. And so I want to ask you this morning, very simple, as Dr. Rogers used to say, profoundly simple, but simply profound. Do you love Jesus Christ? Now, the text, if you have your Bible open there, beginning in verse 1, will tell us why Peter loved him, and we will try to unpackage those for you this morning so that you and I too can learn to love him for the same reasons. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered 
throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are all places in modern-day Turkey today, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being much more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, might be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, those of you may have noticed that I switched from New American to King James for that last verse, and that's the reason is I memorized that last verse 20 years ago in the King James. But I believe God wants to challenge us this morning with the same question He challenged Simon Peter. Peter, do you love me? Put your name there. <laughs> Bill, Susie, do you love Jesus Christ? I want to tell you, love changes everything. It really does. Love can make a long, arduous journey a short little trip when you're in love. Love can make a night in the storm cellar when the clouds are rolling in and there's tornado warnings everywhere. But love can make that time in the storm cellar a joy when you're with somebody you love. <laughs> love changes everything. I changed high schools when I was a junior in high school. I was 15, I changed, and I thought my world had come to an end. I loved playing basketball, and I, our team, all 10th graders, had won county that year. And we were looking forward to two more years, and my dad moved. And I had a girlfriend, and I thought, oh, my world has just ended. And I moved to the big school. The, 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 the class I had, and you young people won't believe this, but I had nine in my class at the old school. But we moved, moved up to the big school. We had 38. And so I got there and went to ball practice, and my heart's heavy. But I remember the, about the first week we were there, I, I was just getting ready to go into ball practice, and I was standing by one of my new friends at this new school, and the girls were coming out of ball practice. And this cute little black-headed girl walked by me. And I said to my new friend, who is that? He said, that's my sister. Well, that was 55 years ago. Life has never been the same for me. You know, I, I, I thought I was in love, but I, I really wasn't. But I soon became love. They, they say, you know, it, it, it's puppy love, but it's sure real to the puppy. And it's lasted a long, long time. It changed my life. We started dating, and I found out that her whole family had a paranoia about tornadoes. And it seemed like every Saturday night when I'd go to pick her up, there would be a storm, uh, uh, you know, warning out. And I'd end up going to the storm house. Now, if it was just me and her, that'd have been fine. <laughs> but we went to the storm house with her mom, her dad, her granddaddy, her grandmama, her uncles, the whole clan. And I mean, it was a festival at the storm cella. I remember after about four weeks of that, her mama said to me, you must really like my daughter or you wouldn't come to the storm cellar every Saturday night 
just to sit with all of us. You know, when you love somebody, you can even go through the storms of life with them. Love changes everything. But there was another love that changed my life six weeks before I graduated from high school. I, I hate to use the term because it is so less than what the term ought to be, fell in love with Jesus Christ. He changed my life forever. Peter fell in love with Christ. He was a work in progress, all of us are. But he tells us in these verses here in front of us why he loved Jesus Christ. And I just want to see if I can unpackage them for you, show you several reasons why he's worthy of our love. Uh, The first thing I would say is I, I love Jesus Christ today because he loved me first. He loved me before I ever loved him. He loved me in such a way that it made me want to love him back. Now, notice what he says in chapter 1, verse 1. You see it here, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. That's Holman's rendering of it. Now, that term chosen, sometimes translated elect, were terms that were formally exclusively applied to the Jews as God's exclusive people. But now Peter is broadening that term. He is applying that term to a persecuted church that has both Jew and Gentile in it. And it must have brought great comfort to the heart of these Gentiles who had been excluded from God's plan up until that point, so to speak. But now they were included in God's plan. Listen to what what 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Or again, just a few verses over in chapter 4, verse 19, we love because He first loved us. That term there, chosen, is not a term to bring fear or anger to our heart. It is an incredibly beautiful word. I'm not going to step off into waters over my head on this. I live with unresolved tension, but here's the thing I want to say to you. The one point I want you to see today is that God loves you first. Whatever else, God's love preceded our love for Him. I don't know about you, but that just humbles me to the core. That humbles me, and it brings glory, glory to God. Peter loved to talk about the grace of God. He mentions the grace of God ten times in this one epistle. Peter said, if if I could imagine, Peter said, it's because of God that I am saved. Oh, I want to thank the Lord today. Don't you love Him because He loved you first? Don't you love him because because he loved you before you even were in his, uh, his, the thoughts of God were even in your heart and mind? Yes, God holds us responsible for repenting and putting our faith in Christ. Yes, we are accountable to God. If I go to hell, I can't blame God for it. If I go to heaven, I can't blame myself for being good enough to get it. It's God. God. And I love him because he first loved me. I, I was, uh, I, I was uh, about 13 years old and in the eighth grade. And the little community where I lived, the, the, the great athletes would meet on Saturday afternoon and play basketball. And there was a lot of those guys, John, taller than me and you. And they had played college ball and were good. This little old community produced a lot of ball players. And I'd go up there and, and, and stand on the sideline, and when one of them needed a, a break, you know, get to rest for a minute, I'd get to go in and, and let him have a little rest. Now, I was so skinny, you know, I weighed about 103 pounds. You could turn sideways under a clothes line and not get wet. I was skinny as I could be. But I'd go out there, and, and I, but I began to grow. But here's what would happen every Saturday afternoon. Coach Chisholm, great guy, and one of the other great athletes, when we'd get there, they would choose teams. And Coach Chisholm would say, I want him, and I want him. And so they put together the teams. I never got chosen. (laughs) 
I mean, when you weigh 103, you know, just not real, not a lot there. But I began to grow. By the time I was in the 10th grade, I was tall as I am now. I got a little muscle on. I got to be a fairly decent athlete. And I remember one day, first time ever, I got to the gym. We're standing there, and Coach Chisholm, the other guy, was choosing sides. Coach Chisholm looked at me and said, Tommy, I want you on my team today. Man. You know what I did? I thought, my goodness, I've been chosen so I don't have to guard hard today. I've been chosen so I can just slough off on defense. Jimmy, I've been chosen so it don't matter what. I you think that's what I did? You think that's the way I felt? If you think that's the way I felt, I, you know, I got some swamp land in Nebraska I'd love to sell you. No. My heart was overwhelmed with the fact that I want to give it everything I got. Why? Coach Chisholm chose me. You know, when I realize how much Jesus loves me, the sacrifice he made for me, it makes me want to give him my all. Love amazing, love divine demands my soul, my life, my all. I love him. I hope you do. I love him because he loved me first. That soul humbles me. The old hymn puts it this way, could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Well, I'm camping out on that. Y'all are listening too well. Let me move on real quickly. Here's the second reason. I love him because he empowers me to do what he asked me to do. Isn't that a good thing? Don't you love him because he never asks you to do something and then says, now, buddy, you're on your own. But he empowers me. Now, where do I get that? Well, I get it from verse 2. Set apart for sanctification by the spirit of obedience. Set apart for sanctification. The word sanctification just simply means so that we might become more like Christ. Uh, you see, regeneration delivers us from the penalty of sin, but sanctification delivers us from the power of sin in our daily life. And God gives us His Spirit. He doesn't just save us and leave us on our own. Some believe that we're saved by grace and then we're on our own as far as righteous living. Listen to what, the, what Paul wrote the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 3, he said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? No. No. Here's the clincher. In the Old Testament, God's law told us what to do, but it didn't empower us to do it and held us accountable when we didn't do it. The poet put it this way, work and do, the law demands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. But a sweeter song the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. Hallelujah. It tells me what to do and then empowers me to do it. I love him because he empowers me. I was greatly influenced in my early ministry by the independent fundamentalist Baptist movement, holiness by rules, more concerned with the length of my hair. I don't have to worry about that anymore. The color of my shirt or whether or not my wife wore slacks than the glory of God in my life. I say that with shame. But I was bound with a sense of legalism 
sanctification by my own efforts. Some of you may be tied up into that. And I thank God that somebody gave me the book of Galatians by Donald Ray Barnhouse. And I listened to that book on record. You young people don't even know what that is, although I think they're making a comeback now. I listened to Galatians by Donald Gray Barnhouse 30 times. I memorized it. And the Spirit of God used the truth in this incredible book to free me from the bondage of legalism. Holiness by rules. And it dawned upon me that everything God asks me to do, He empowers me to do it. The righteousness which He demands is the righteousness which He supplies. I love him for that. Well, let's go to number three. Number three. I love him because he defeated my worst enemy. Who's your worst enemy? (laughs) Our worst enemy and last enemy is death. Listen to what Paul said. In 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Well, you say, Brother Tommy, where do you get that in the text? Well, look at verse 3. Who has begotten us again to a living hope by the, what church? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hey, I've got good news for you, Germantown. Easter is true. Jesus is alive. The Scripture says that He's proven to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. And I I love Him because when He died, was buried, and rose again, he He put His foot on the neck of death and stomped death and killed death. And I don't have to fear death anymore. I love Him for that. Went to Korea several years ago my wife and I, on a simultaneous revival. And the churches over there had prepared extensively for an evangelistic outreach. I had heard about the praying church in Korea. I always wanted to witness that. But I was really overwhelmed when I got there. I'm afraid that they're moving in the same direction that our churches here are now, (laughs) which is sad. But for about 30 or 40 years, Korea experienced a mighty wave of the movement of the Spirit of God. And so when we got there, we found out that the churches had made appointments for us to go and share the gospel. And so we would start early in the morning, we would go and there would be appointments made, and we would go and share the gospel. And we had a little track. It had Korean on one side. English on the other side. We didn't know their language. They didn't know us. But we would sit down. We would read the English. They would read the Korean. (laughs) Nothing complicated about it. We'd get through and we'd say, would you like to surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ? I've never seen anything like it. Person after person after person bowed their head and surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. It troubled me to the point that I went to the pastor and I said, Pastor, it bothers me that you brought us 10,000 miles to share the gospel with the most ready and ripe people I've ever seen in my life. Why did you bring us over here? They didn't need Americans. He said, Pastor, you don't understand. He said, Americans... We are free today in South Korea. We are not communists today because of Americans. Some of you sitting in this room probably helped provide that freedom. He said, had it not been for Americans, we would be communists today. We love Americans. And when you speak, 
we listen because you defeated our worst enemy. My dear friend, I can think of no better reason for you to love Jesus. He defeated your worst enemy. He went, he went into the grave. Scripture talks about it. He pioneered the grave. He went into the grave, stayed three days, three nights, and came out victoriously. As the song says, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from that dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Don't you love him? Because he defeated your worst enemy. Well, let's move on. Number four, I love him because he gives me a wonderful inheritance. <laughs> He's made me a rich man. You probably didn't know that a rich man was preaching to you today. My dad was a sharecropper. <laughs> he usually came out on the wrong end of the share. He uh, worked hard picking cotton, hoeing, and milking 30 cows twice a day for $100 a month. Don't that bless you? But my dad didn't leave me much except a work ethic, a love, and an appreciation for all he did to put food on our family and a roo- uh, in, our, in our stomachs and a roof over our head. He didn't leave much physically, but I'll tell you what. I have an inheritance. If you're here today and you're saved, you do too. Listen to what he says, verse 4. An inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, and that fades not away. That's the same word the Septuagint used to refer to Israel's inheritance in the promised land. Peter adds some descriptive words here that are very powerful. It's imperishable. It refers to what is not corruptible, not liable to death, not subject to destruction. Unlike the Israelites' earthly inheritance that came and went because of their sins, the believer's spiritual inheritance will never be subject to destruction. He uses the word undefiled. It describes things that are unstained or unpolluted. It it means to be flawless or perfect. And it says it will never fade away. It was a word used in secular Greek to describe a flower that did not wither or die. In this context, it suggests that the believers have an inheritance that will never lose its magnificence. None of the decaying elements of the world can affect the kingdom of heaven. I love him because I'm going to heaven when I die. Don't you? I love him because I'm not going to hell. Jesus died to forgive me of my sin. And I'm going to get to spend eternity in heaven. I want to get to be a part of that new creation Revelation talks about. That new heaven and that new earth. I love him because of that. And when you add to the fact that it says that that's reserved, see what it says? It's reserved in heaven for you. That word reserved means to guard, protect. It means to set aside. Listen to what Kenneth Weiss said about that. He said, heaven is a safe deposit box where God is guarding our inheritance, guarding our inheritance for us under constant surveillance. And then he goes on to say, The participle is in the perfect tense, speaking of a past completed action having present results. Here's the way we could translate it. Has been laid up and is now kept guarded in a safe deposit box. Wow. I've been around long enough to see this happen many, many times where a set of parents work hard, save, lay back some money so they'll be able to leave their children an inheritance. But end of life issues, 
nursing homes, hospice care, death expenses. All of it's gone. But there is an inheritance that's reserved. It'll never be taken away. Our reserve, reservation in heaven has already been made. And I love him for that. Well, I've got to hurry. Just another minute or two and I'll be through. I, I'm going to tell you I love him because he protects me. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, we are kept by the power of God. I, I love him because I don't have to worry about losing my salvation next week or next month. The Scripture says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, eternal security is not based on the faith of men, but on the faithfulness of God. I love the word in Jude 1. It says, we are preserved. <laughs> don't you like that? I know some Baptists that translate that, we are pickled. <laughs> no, we're preserved. I love him because he keeps us saved. Well, here's my last point. And this is the one that's the hardest. If you're an unbelieving friend here today, dear precious unbelieving friend, you're going you're gonna to struggle with this one. This is going to be the hardest one for you to believe. Truthful is, it's hard even for us who are believers to believe. But here's the last reason I love him. I love him because he gives purpose to my suffering. Listen to what he says. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That says, very simply and very quickly, that says two things. It says that all the suffering that God allows to come into my life has a season and it has a reason. It has a season because he says, for a little while. And in the text, the language of the New Testament, that word is highlighted. It's, 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 he's saying that, that our tests are not going to run forever. Now, it may seem like forever for us, and even though it may last a, a, a month, a year, or a decade, compared to eternity, it's always a little while. Compared to eternity, anything we go through is a little while. So I'm thankful that God's purpose in my suffering is not only for, for a season, but it is for a reason. Like gold that's tested in the fire, God puts the fire of trials to our faith, not to hurt us, but to purify us. And then Peter says, Wow, whom having not seen, you love. And, and though now you see him not, yet believing. There's that word, church. That's the word for you this morning. Yet believing. Do you believe that? Do you believe? Do you believe that he took initiation in your life? Do you believe that he loved you before you loved him? Do you believe that he's given you an inheritance? Do you believe that he keeps you safe? Do you believe that he makes your sufferings have purpose and meaning? Yet believing, you rejoice. Notice what he says. Not did you used to love me, but do you love me? Every test of assurance of salvation in the New Testament is in the present tense. Not he that used to obey, he that obeyeth. Not he that used to love, he that loveth. Not 
You see, salvation is not a 30-second experience, period. It is an initial experience with additional and continuing results. Jesus didn't just save you so you could go to heaven when you die. He saved you so he could come and indwell your humanity and express his love and life through you for as long as you live. Well, Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? He says to Tommy Vinson, Tommy, I don't want to know how many hospitals you've visited the last half a century. I don't want to know how many sermons you've preached in the last half a century. I don't want to know how many mission trips you've gone on. I want to know one thing. Tommy, do you love me? Can we say with Peter, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Would you bow your head with me? The essence of being a Christian is loving Jesus. The Bible teaches us that the greatest commandment is this. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The New Testament teaches that it's impossible to love God if you don't love Jesus. So I want to encourage you today. If you've never come to know and love Jesus, listen to his word today. Listen to what the reasons he gives us for loving him. They're overwhelming. My friend, please don't walk out of the room today failing to commit and surrender your heart and life to one who loved you so much that he gave up heaven itself to come, dwell among us for 33 years, live without sin, die for your sin and mine, buried for three days and rose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave, ascended to heaven and sent his spirit down to convict us of our need for a Savior. My dear friend, if that's where you are today, if the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you need Christ, then come to Jesus today. The staff will be here. Just step out of your seat and come and say, I need today to love Jesus. You come. If you're here without a church home, we invite you to come this morning. Say to one of the counselors, we'd like to become a part of Germantown Baptist. That's all you have to say. They'll take it from there. There may be some believers here today that just simply need to slip out and get on your knees and talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, my, my love is cold. I, I, I'm not in love like I used to. I, I, I need to have my love restored. I'm like the Ephesian Christians. I've left my first love, and I want to come back today. Maybe just slip up here and kneel and talk to Jesus about it. Now, Father, in these moments of invitation, have your will and way in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, let's stand together as we sing and worship. You be obedient to the Lord.